Hi everybody and welcome to this month's uh, Dalton uh, seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our seminar on developing fusion regulation where we're uh, joined by Dr. Sally Forbes, Dr. Barag Vyas, Professor Drew Matthews, Ted Hicks and Kevin Lee. Um, so the format of the meeting is that all of our speakers are going to give five minutes on their point of view of what we need to be working on to develop um, fusion regulation followed by which we will have uh, some discussion and hopefully lots of interaction and questions from you in the audience. So please do put your questions in the chat or use the raise hand uh, button as well if you have any questions. Just to let you know, this is being recorded and potentially live streamed on YouTube, we're not sure. Um, so if you don't wanna be in the recording, please do keep your cameras off and keep yourselves uh, muted during the discussion. So I'll now introduce our speakers. Um, we have with us today, Sally Forbes, uh, based at UKAEA, who has worked at the Cullum Centre for Fusion Energy for four years and is the Fusion Safety Authority for UKAEA. In this role, she's led, she leads a small team providing technical expertise in fusion safety, security and environment, supporting the development of the regulatory framework for future fusion power plants. Prior to working in fusion, uh, Sally has had 20 years of experience in the nuclear industry, including the development of safety cases and safety management processes. So Sally, would you like to start off with what you think we need to work on in developing fusion regulation. Well, good afternoon, everybody, as the first speaker up, and thank you very much for joining us. As you probably noticed, fusion is very much in the media at the moment with the results from JET last week, so it's very timely that uh, Anika has set up this session for us today. Um, so there's, there's, there's three points I want to kind of pull out that will hopefully be a thread throughout today's discussion. Um, the first is, my, my job role is a fusion safety authority, so first and foremost, uh, in my mind, is the safety of future fusion power plant. Um, so if we consider the different aspects, there's safety, there's environment, there's security. One of the main things and part of uh, the job role of my team is to look at proportionality of regulation. Um, fusion is a nuclear process, but it is very different um, in physics terms and also from a point of view of the level of hazards it might pose. Um, and that level of hazard is, is quite different, um, significantly lower from what we associate with fission nuclear power plants. So it's first to make that distinction that fission and fusion, um, whilst they are both things going on with nuclei are different processes and, and have very much different levels of hazards. Um, that is potentially hazards to people working on the plant, hazards to pe hazards potentially to the public if there were a significant accident and, and release of radioactive material. So obviously a majority of power future fusion power plants will use tritium, which is a radioactive gas. Um, so it's very important that a regulatory framework is, is proportionate to that level of hazard. Um, it's also important, and I think it's something that Ted will probably pick up on, that there are many different types of fusion. Um, you might just think fusion is fusion, but to those of us in the industry, there are very many flavours of that. Um, some of them use different fuels, some radioactive, some not, um, some maybe very small machines, large machines. So any regulation has really got to cover quite a broad range of technologies. But if you think about other regulations, chemical regulations, or indeed nuclear, there are again, many different flavors of technology. So that's the first thing to think of is, is proportionality. Um, the second point for me is, is transparency. We're developing a new technology. Um, we are potentially developing a different set of regulations. And we really need to have stakeholder engagement. Who are the stakeholders? Well, every single one of you that are on today are obviously a stakeholder because you've joined us. Um, so in the UK, um, the Government Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, um, I know we have some colleagues on the line today, uh, many of you will be aware that before Christmas they launched a consultation on um, the way forward for fusion and the regulatory framework. Um, lots of replies to that, I believe, both from organisations, individuals. So it's, it's really important to bring those stakeholders, yourselves, the industry public along with us on, on this journey. Um, and the third thing I'd like to talk about, um, uh, well, to relate to that last point, actually, um, Parag will speak in a moment. And again, one of the public documents that's been issued, Parag will tell you about related to the regulation side of fusion. Um, 
And the final area, and we notice we have Kevin on here from Canada, who will uh, be introduced in a moment, is international engagement. Fusion, uh, for anybody that involves, it knows it. it's a very international community. Um, the large experiments like JET at Cullum are, are, are kind of related to, to the European. Um, ETA, the international tokamak. Um, so it's again we would like to make this industry as smooth as we can in the future internationally and, and maybe seek harmonization where possible in regulation we're we're ahead of the curve um so we we've, we're now forming a very good community of international sort of regulators and, and safety support organizations uh working with the international atomic energy authority to bring many nations together so that's kind of my final point that whatever we do really let's try and do this as an international community so we can we can do it once and we can share technologies or share the implementation of technologies around the world without having multiple different regulatory frameworks and requirements so that's that's a few of the topics that i thought might be pertinent today so thank you anika thank you sally for a brilliant introduction in, into the issues um so i'm going to go to dr parag vias next who's a member of the regulatory horizons council He's also the managing director of Panitech Power Limited, which develops sustainable energy technology and the director of PV10 Consult, a technology strategy consulting company. He has worked for over 25 years in the energy and transport industry sectors and former roles have included head of technology at Agreco PLC and head of advanced concept center at Rolls-Royce. He spent a decade working in Germany and Switzerland and has a wealth of experience with identifying disruptive trends that lead to innovation and is a chartered engineer and a fellow of the Institute Institution of Energy, Engineering and Technology. So, um, Barag, over to you about what you think we need to be focusing on. Thank you, Anika. Uh, so, um, and as Sally mentioned, uh, the regulatory, I, I'm here in my capacity as a council member of the Regulatory Horizons Council. Uh, and we published, um, towards sort of spring last year, uh, we published a set of recommendations uh, on, on fusion and how it should be regulated. So what I'll do is, is explain a little bit about what the RHC is and does to set the context. Uh, and then I can talk to some of the points that we brought out in the report. Uh, so, so firstly, just the RHC and what is it? It's a, it's a relatively new uh, body. Um, we were constituted about two years ago and we're an independent expert advisory group um, that, um, that feeds into BASE essentially, Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Uh, and what we do is we, we aim to recommend or look at uh, regulations for that really help, um, help the UK uh, adopt um, in, a, in a rapid and safe way, adopt disruptive new technology. And we're con constituted of, of five members from different disciplines. Uh, and we're not aiming to be domain experts on one in any particular topic, uh, but what we like to do is bring expertise from various disciplines, um, whether it's the energy sector or from medicine, uh, from academia, um, to we like to bring in expertise from different sectors to look at a problem in an agile and multidisciplinary way. Okay. Uh, and how we work is we, we do what we call essentially deep dives into a particular topic. Uh, and look at the issues, engage with stakeholders, uh, and derive our recommendations. They they then go to Bayes, and we we are advisory, so we can't tell anyone. We don't tell anyone what to do. But essentially, um, the government is uh, through our charter obliged to then consider those recommendations and then respond to them, um, and they're free to adopt them or not uh, as they wish, uh, and. Um, we're part of the, I think we've, it's been good that we've been part of the process, I hope, of looking at the issue of, of how best to look at fusion regulation. Okay. So in terms of our report, uh, er, very early on, we worked with Bayes and we set ourselves what we call the exam question um, of how can the UK continue to move towards an innovation friendly and long term framework for fusion. And the background to that at that time was uh, the UKAA um, and, and you know, part of Sally's organization uh, were about to launch a competition to cite their STEP device. Uh, and STEP is a type of technology called a tokamak, uh, and it's a development from various other uh, tokamaks around the world, including, including the JET device at Cullum in Oxfordshire as well. 
Um, so there was that imperative to work out, well, what should the framework be for that particular device uh, in the UK? But also what we've noticed around the world, there, are, uh, there is a lot of private investment going into um, uh, fusion of all sorts of different technologies. Uh, so we've seen, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of, of pounds and dollars being raised that's going into private companies. And they are also now seriously developing fusion energy technology. So there is a broader question of, well, how should the UK um, be thinking about regulating not just that, but also commercial fusion uh, in the future? And so although this might be a long term technology uh, per se, uh, these questions need to be answered now so that the devices can be designed um, according to whatever the regulations um, are um, in place. Okay, so this was really the imperative for our question, and we split it up into two steps, uh, steps so, so to speak. Um, first, really, because we had a better understanding of what step was, and it was um, the, 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 the sighting of that device uh, was planned, you know, the competition to launch the sighting of the device was planned to be um, last year, start last year. Uh, we thought we'd bound our question at looking at step first and then broaden out the question to commercial fusion more generally after that. Uh, we, we looked at what was in place already around the world in terms of regulation of fusion. That included uh, in the UK, the regulation of the JET tokamak, uh, another tokamaks at Cullum in the UK. And, and the framework around that was it was being regulated by the HSC uh, along with the Environment Agency. Uh, and so we were engaged with those regulators. We also engaged with other types of regulators like the ONR, um, some of the more uh, devolved, some of the devolved regulators as well, SEPA in Scotland, for example. Uh, and um, we also made sure to, to identify best practice from around the world. So we, we talked to ETA in France, which is a very well-known project, and also um, people in the USA and Canada. Uh, and we also talked to industry, both, both public sector, so um, Sally's colleagues within UKAA, but also private sector colleagues as well. Uh, and we also consulted with various parts of government and other institutions. Uh, and drew from sources, including the regulator's code, okay? So having done a lot of consultation to understand um, the nature of the issues, uh, various frameworks, understand perceptions, um, we then formulated and drafted a set of principles to help guide us. How could we, um, what are we trying to achieve with, um, a framework, a regulation framework. What are we trying to achieve? What are the, you know, what does good look like? And we drafted a set of five principles, okay? Ideally, any kind of fusion, commercial fusion framework should be one, proportionate and agile, um, that there should be a perception and trust in that framework, that that framework takes advantage of any lessons learned in the UK and around the world, uh, that it, it's a framework that enables experimentation, forward-looking, and the adoption of rapid and safe adoption of new technology, and that it's it's supportive and collaborative uh, in terms of being able to share best practice uh, and work with partners around the world. So those were the principles that we drafted. Uh, again, we did consult as well um, with with regulators and with industry in terms of were they the right principles to be working with. And from that, and given all of our research and uh, an engagement that we had conducted, we then drafted our recommendations. And essentially what we found was the framework that we have currently with JET at Cullum, where the HSE takes the lead in partnership with the Environment Agency to regulate that device, uh, we found that to be appropriate for both step and commercial fusion more generally. And the key reason for that is that although in the future, the scale of, of tokamaks and other devices might be very different and considerably bigger than what, than what we have at present, um, the nature of the hazards, 
and the difference between fusion and fission, it, it leads to significantly, it leads to orders of magnitude of difference in, in risk levels. Uh, and so given that and given the, the um, competence in HSE and EA and their track record um, and what, um, what we understand from the nature of hazards, we felt secure in recommending uh, that option. Uh, and we recommended that the government uh, consult on that basis. And we issued a report last spring and we're very pleased to see that uh, in fact, uh, there is now a consultation uh, and uh, that uh, we we hope that this is a very you know fruit we've been this has been a fruitful process um, for everyone in, involved. Uh, and I just like to end. With, I'd really like to thank all of all of the various regulators, all of the various um, stakeholders that uh, we engaged with, uh, and also we had great support from the base secretariat that uh, in the ROT that supported us to to engage um, uh, to, to 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 make this report happen. So yes, thank you very much as well. Thank you, Barack, for that really important uh, perspective from the RHC. Um, I'm now going to move on to our next speaker, Professor Duan Matthews, who's based at the University of Manchester. He began his career at the UK Atomic Energy Authority's Harwell Laboratory researching and managing research in fast reactor and nuclear safety. His research was mainly on computer modelling of nuclear fuel and radiation damage. In the 90s, he was involved in the privatisation of AEA technology, the commercial part of UK AEA, and then managed materials and chemistry research with the new organisation before moving to Japan for five years as regional director for Asia Pacific. In the early 2000s through UCL, he worked to assist Cullum set up the Fusion Materials program. Uh, from 2001, he worked on DTI and UK trade and investment activities uh, as an energy technology specialist. The latter part of this role covered advising on the investment and supply chain for nuclear new builds. And currently he's a visiting professor at the Dalton Nuclear Institute at University of Manchester, where he teaches at postgrad level and has a particular interest in advanced reactors and fusion. So I'll now, now pass it over to Duan. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you, you can hear me okay, Anika? Right, good. So um, I, I want to talk about the technical challenges of uh, regulation for, for fusion. And I'm, I'm just going to focus on, on one type of fusion, which is the DT fusion, because we have um, the use of tritium and we have lots of neutrons uh, with, with that. And I, I'd also point out that we've got very little experience because the experimental reactors that we've been using over the last few years, even, even with JET, where bits of tritium have been put in, um, the, the sort of hazards that we, uh, we, we find are, are just not there yet. I agree, uh, of course, that, um, the, that the, uh, at the high end of risk, the, 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 the situation is much different from, from fission reactors and we're not likely to have the, the sort of accidents that uh, you have with uh, Chernobyl or, or, or Fukushima. However, that's not the case if we go to lower, uh, uh, the, the lower risk hazards. They could be much more frequent with a, uh, uh, unless we're very careful with, with, a, with a fusion reactor. So the first thing is tritium, lots of tritium. Um, uh, uh, in one year, uh, a one gigawatt uh, thermal reactor uh, uh, producing, uh, of using fusion processes will, will need about 60 kilograms of tritium. That's, that's about two times 10 to the 19 uh, becquerels of, uh, of tritium. Um, it's, uh, it, it, the, the limits at the moment on release into water is about a thousand becquerels per litre of water um, uh, around the world. And it's going to be really difficult to meet that target with the amounts of tritium that uh, will be in the reactor. In, at any one time, well, because the tritium has to be produced within the reactor and the breeder, um, uh, th there will be something like 20 kilograms of tritium hanging around the reactor at that time. There are lots of routes for that to get into the, uh, into the atmosphere. There's the energy conversion systems is one of the worst routes. It can go through the coolant, what, what, whatever the coolants are, through heat exchangers, and then out that route into, into the atmosphere. Um, we've got the tritium management systems. We have to extract the tritium from the blanket. Uh, we've got to transfer it and, and store it. Um, and then there's the levels of containment. Uh, there are four levels of containment with the, uh, the starting with the vacuum vessel and, and, and going, going up through the cryostat 
um, to, uh, eventually to the bio, bio, uh, bio shield. But these are crisscrossed with pipe work and ports and windows, and uh, we have to take it all apart in order to be able to do maintenance. So tritium, big problem. So um, the, the next thing is activation of structures. We've got lots of neutrons, 14 MeV neutrons. So we're getting a lot of reactions which we haven't found before. We have these threshold reactions, which are often accompanied by uh, uh, radioactivity invo uh, involving hard gamma. Um, we have the more usual uh, lower energy activation processes uh, uh, again, but the main, main things that are going to take the brunt of it are the things that see the 14 MeV neutrons, which is the first wall, the, the first uh, 10 centimeters or so of the blanket and the, uh, and the diverter. Um, uh, tritium source uh, term, sorry, source term levels of, um, of activation products are going to be similar to the tritium levels in, 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 the, in, in, in these um, central parts of the, uh, of the reactor. So it's going to be really difficult to handle uh, these intensely radioactive situations, particularly uh, during maintenance. Then heat generation. Um, if we do the calculations for these, uh, these parts of the reactor, which are going to see the 14 MeV neutrons, uh, we're going to see uh, levels which are not, uh, not as large as the ones we to see in fission reactors, because of course we don't have the fission products, but, but certainly more than the structural materials that we, to, we, we see in, uh, in, in, in fission reactors. So um, calculations that have been done for ITA and the European demo uh, give about, four, uh, about 40 megawatts of residual heat per kilogram, uh, gigawatt thermal of fusion power. So the, we, we're going to have to find ways of uh, keeping the reactor cool. And it, we're going to have to have long periods of waiting before we can start the maintenance on, on the reactor. So that's going to limit the, uh, the, uh, limit the, um, uh, the load factor of the reactors. And that's one of the reasons why we have to concentrate on finding um, a low activation materials to use in the reactors. Next, waste volumes. Uh, intermediate level waste produced from these activations could be something of around 10 times those of a, free, a fission reactor for the same amount of power production uh, measured, say, in terawatt, terawatt hours. That means as well that we have to have decay storage uh, to reduce the amount of intermediate level waste for, that goes into a, a ge geological disposal facility. So um, uh, even so, um, uh, the, the, these bits of the reactor which are close to the plasma and see the 14 MeV neutrons are going to be intermediate level waste for, the, for maybe uh, more than 200 years, which means they have to go into ge geological uh, disposal. Recycling is going to be very important because a lot of materials like tungsten, um, uh, 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 beryllium um, uh, components, flebe or, 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 and lead, um, there's just too, too much of them uh, to, to, to handle. And um, beryllium and lead, uh, of course, are quite toxic. So we don't want to uh, keep those in, in surface storage. So we really need to, to focus on recycling the, the, the materials for, uh, for fusion reactors. Um, then, um, what, what are the accidents that we could have? And there's a whole series of accidents because there are so many forces on, on, the, on the structures. There's the magnetic forces coming from these very intense magnets that are being used and in, induced electrical uh, forces be, uh, by the induced currents from changes in the, in the levels of the magnetic fields. So there's loss of vacuum accidents where you have a, a failure of the vacuum vessel. Um, of course, this needn't be the, 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 the thick walls of the vessel, but it could be the, uh, the windows or instru instrument pe penetrations or pipework. Water ingress that get, would get into the center of the hot parts of the reactor. Minor fires or explosion from hydrogen or dust, um, uh, which is created on the inside of the, uh, of, of the first wall. And remember that um, tungsten trioxide is volatile at the sort of temperatures that would happen in an accident. 
Then we have the possibility of leakage of cryogenic coolants that could contact the vacuum vessel and cause failures. And uh, uh, also leakage of the blanket cooling or uh, and a blanket and cooling material uh, uh, as they pass out of the reactor. All of these could lead to emissions of radioactivity. And finally, I have to say that um, the IAA has published some quite irresponsible statements that there isn't a safeguards problem with, um, with fusion. There is a safeguards problem with DT fusion. Any, any machine that produces a large number of neutrons is a, a, is a safeguards hazard. It's possible, uh, for instance, to, to take blanket cassettes and hide fissile material, uh, 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 sorry, fertile material in, in, blank, in, in blanket cassettes. So um, we wouldn't do it in the UK, but if, if uh, uh, a hostile power was to uh, buy a fusion reactor, it could use a fusion reactor um, to, to generate uh, uh, fissile materials. If it, 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 and also we have to remember that lithium-6 um, uh, enriched lithium is, is also, uh, it's not a safeguard material, but it is a, a dual use material that is, that is heavily controlled. So all of these uh, are, are technical factors have to be taken into account for regulation. So sorry to be depressing. <laughs> Thank you, John. Definitely lots of food for thought um, there. I'm sure we'll be discussing a lot of those points uh, later on. Uh, I'm gonna move on to our next speaker now, who's gonna give the researcher perspective in the field. So Ted Hicks. Uh, from the Fusion CDT, uh, based at the University of Manchester. He, Ted studied mechanical engineering at Manchester before working in the nuclear industry for a year as a graduate and has worked on materials testing projects, including lead fast cooled reactors and modular reactors. Now he's back at Manchester as a student on the Fusion CDT, where he is researching hydrogen isotope separation using 2D materials. Um, so I'll pass it over to Ted. Thank you for that. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, just want to double clarify that I am uh, in my first year as a student, so I'm far from an expert, far from the, the pool of experience that everyone else has. So take everything I say with at least one or two grains of salt. Um, so I come from the opinion that since fusion is far from a mature technology, you know, we're still yet to achieve uh, Q greater than one net engineering energy gain. We're not quite at the point where fusion is actually commercialized. Um, and what's good about what's been going on recently is that you know there has been lots of private and public investment but mostly private um and there's all these different routes which people are trying to achieve fusion you know you've got to name the the two front runners you've got magnetic confinement and inertial confinement and uh you know even different reactions like mostly people are looking at deuterium tritium uh, but also i think helion is looking at deuterium helium three which all has different ramifications for the safety of how these reactions, how these reactors are supposed to be run and what is what is good for them. I mean, even the way that these reactors are built and designed is vastly different depending on how you're looking at it. You know, you've got stellarators and tokamaks for magnetic confinement and you've got laser driven and magnetic driven ICF inertial confinement. So I think it's very difficult to think about what fusion regulations should actually look like because it's definitely important to keep to allow this industry space to innovate as it has been um, i think Bayes' strategy is to keep the fusion regulation technology neutral um, so def definitely a difficulty in finding something that's common in fusion that's not uh individual to each individual technology so you know if we're focused too much on magnetic confinement and tokamaks then we might inadvertently put the brakes on something like ICF or something else without really meaning to. Um, and it's definitely important not to snuff the flame before we've even got it working. Um, that being said, so, you know, we're definitely in the research phase of fusion. So I'm sort of hesitant for extensive regulation specific to fusion for that reason at this point in time. Um, but obviously safety needs to be the absolute core of what we're doing for any regulation. Um, but I think that the modern safety of nuclear power should speak for the effectiveness of UK regulation already. Um, so if I pull this horrible little stat that I've taken from ONR, you know, you've got 
you're five times more likely to be killed by lightning than nuclear power. And it's, it does definitely miss the point of a lot of people's concerns about nuclear power. Like I think um, that's, that's more related to fission anyway, but you know, fusion is being designed as inherently a much safer technology with lower level waste and reduced risk of proliferation. You know, I'm hesitant to say that's, you know, all fine and good. I think Joanne has some good points. Um, but I think given that we're looking for step, looking to have step in the, on the grid, I think it's 2040, um, we've definitely still got some time to sort of carry on as we are with our existing regulations for, you know, supporting technologies. And, you know, we've got regulations for tritium handling and transport. We've got regulations for health and safety. Uh, the Environment Agency, like what Paragua was saying, has been doing a good job. Um, there are regulations for working with high power lasers, working with strong magnetic fields. So I think for the time being, that's OK. Um, I'm definitely in agreement with Chuan that we need better understanding of how these materials are going to perform after being in these demanding environments for the lifetime of reactor. You know, it's really, really important about uh, how they're going to be after the exposure to these high energy neutrons, tritium retention, because that is really important to the, the structural properties and the proliferation safety ramifications for, for each of these technologies. Um, so definitely as we develop our understanding of that, I think it's important to share that internationally and I think have something formalised as soon as possible. So I think Sally might agree with that. Then obviously fusion is still a nuclear technology. So as we do get closer, I think we need to really put the brakes on. We don't want something completely um, unregulated from previous, like we, we've got good regulations in this country. So I think then we can start looking at maybe having nuclear site licenses for uh, fusion sites and basically all nuclear sites as we get closer and closer, which I think is somewhat technology neutral, maybe something a bit more stripped back depending on where we are. I think we'll have a better idea of what the uh, requirements and safety are in about 10-ish years, maybe a bit less. So. Thank you. That's my opinion. Feel free to poke any holes, little or small than that. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Ted. I think that was great. Um, so we'll move on to our final speaker uh, to give that international perspective. Uh, we've got Kevin Lee from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, uh, where he's leading the team analysing disruptive, innovative and emerging technology. This team aims to ready the CNSC to evaluate and regulate the technology in the nuclear industry. He's also engaged in work readying uh, the Commission's regulatory framework for the regulation of advanced reactor technology and small modular reactors. He's also active on numerous other policy and regulatory files at the CNSC across the broad spectrum of the Canadian nuclear sector, including fusion technologies. He has over 25 years of providing regulatory policy and operational ex expertise and extensive experience in government includes nearly a decade spent as special assistant to the right honorable Jean Crichon. Uh, so over, over to you, Kevin. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, speaking last is advantageous in the debate. I'm not so sure about uh, when it's a panel discussion. So um, a couple of things. First, the CNSC, a little bit about us. We're the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Uh, in Canada, we regulate all nuclear activity and all nuclear substances. So uh, as we used to say, cradle to grave, uh, and that includes fusion. So we're, we're the sole nuclear regulatory body uh, in Canada. Uh, we have a bit of a weird mandate in the sense that, yes, we have a mandate to protect the health, safety, security, and environment. Uh, we have a mandate to protect our international obligations vis-a-vis uh, -vis non proliferation but we also have a somewhat unique mandate in terms of other regulatory bodies, even in Canada, and that's to disseminate uh, objective uh, technical, scientific, and regulatory information. So we're out in the public quite often uh, speaking. So regarding fusion, um, it, you might be interested to know that we actually do regulate currently two fusion facilities uh, in Canada, uh, subcritical obviously, and it's really, it's not a, um, it's not a license for the, I'll use the term reactor, although I'm not sure we should be using the term reactor when it comes to, uh, to fusion facilities. Uh, it's for substances, so we basically regulate them based on a substance license. Um, but a few things around that. Uh, first, one of them is, is General Fusion, which I think is a company many of you in England would be familiar with. Uh, they're actually headquartered in uh, British Columbia. 
So when it comes to fusion, should they go commercial and should it be a full scale commercial reactor? Uh, it would be currently regulated under our class one uh, facilities license. Now, a, a class one facility license is uh, exactly how we regulate our current fleet of uh, power reactors in Canada, as well as our, our research reactors and our experimental reactors. So having that same framework, we realize is not necessarily the best fit uh, for a fusion facility, but currently that's what we would be looking at having to do. Um, I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, you alluded to the fact that I've done some work on uh, advanced reactor technology. So starting about, I would say, 12 years ago, we began making a regulatory framework and, and we tried to make it, number one, ready for uh, advanced reactor technology, so SMRs. We also tried to make sure that it was, in essence, technology neutral as much as possible. Now, our current NPPs, so the fleet of can do, as most people know, somewhat unique to Canada, exported to various countries around the world. But we've tried to make sure that we would be ready for, uh, again, advanced reactor technologies, tech neutral as much as possible. And that enabled us, I think, to be ready in many ways to also regulate uh, fusion facilities down the road. Um, in terms of where this kind of all comes together, uh, we did a discussion paper or a white paper uh, seven years ago, and it was really focused on advanced reactor technologies, but we also had a little bit in there about fusion, and we were seeking feedback as to what stakeholders in Canada internationally thought about fusion. And one of the things that really came through uh, was that you cannot, in essence, view fusion and fission as similar uh, activities, that uh, the risks inherent in fusion are very different uh, than they are in, uh, in, in fission and fusion. And I think everyone agrees on that. So there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to that. Uh, so fairly good feedback. Um, as fusion became a little more prevalent in terms of stakeholder engagement in Canada, one of the things that we decided we needed to do was we, we sort of did this dive on our regulatory framework, i.e. are we ready for advanced reactor technologies? We sort of thought, yes, we are. Are we ready for uh, different technologies? We thought, yes, by and large, we are. We've created our framework that way. But there was a bit of a question mark around fusion technologies. Um, and we felt the best way to maybe ascertain whether or not we were in fact ready was to uh, put out a request for proposal. And we did a research project and the successful company was actually Kinetrix, a well-known international nuclear uh, company. And what we basically got them to do for us was number one, uh, look at the frameworks around the world in terms of what other regulatory bodies are doing uh, with fusion. We also had them do the same scan that we did on our regulatory framework to see whether or not we're ready for fusion and to see where we might need some uh, different alignment maybe uh, than we currently had. And by and large, it came back with what we thought it would, which was good. Number one, it said, yeah, you're more or less ready for fusion, but there are a few areas where clarity would help. Uh, number two, uh, regulating a fusion facility the same way you would regulate a nuclear power plant is probably not the best way to proceed. And it brought up, uh, in essence, a, a lot of talk within the CNSC as to how the best way to proceed and how are we going to maybe have to change a little bit our regulatory framework to accommodate fusion technology. So some of the other things that came out, and I'll go to it now, is um, in essence, there's really sort of in terms of the CNSC early thinking. And before I tell you about that, I'm gonna tell you quickly about our regulatory framework, a very easy way to describe it. Generally speaking, I would say that the UK and the way they regulate uh, the nuclear industry is from my point of view, sort of goal-based, performance-based. And, and that's a very good way to regulate. There's a lot of positives in that. Um, the United States, on the other hand, the USNRC, um, very prescriptive-based. Uh, so they will tell you exactly what you need to do and you will not deviate from that. We're somewhere in the middle, um, much like everything. Uh, Canadians are you know, somewhere caught between the UK uh, and uh, the United States in terms of you know, our judiciary, everything. So it's not unique that our regulatory framework around uh, nuclear would be the same, but here's some of our early thinking. Number one, we are really still evolving how we're going to regulate fusion technology. We're, we're not set on a given direction. 
uh, we're fully cognizant of the fact that fusion is not fission. And I think that's been you know, really brought to light. Uh, the risks that are inherent in, in fusion technologies are very different from those of fission. And also that fusion technology is not one technology. Uh, you know, we, we heard earlier that there's different ways of, of creating that reaction. There's different ways of confining that reaction. And because of that, they're all different and they all have very different risk profiles. Um, the one thing that we're really trying to do uh, as much as possible as a regulatory body is to get very educated and understand the fusion technologies that are out there. Um, we're fortunate, as I said, we do have few, two fusion companies in Canada. They've engaged with us and they're helping us understand. Um, one of the most difficult things maybe uh, for a regulatory body to do, I think, when it comes to fusion is to avoid that fission reactor mentality, uh, thinking that you have to have things in place to the same level that you might have to uh, for a fission reactor. Uh, in terms of how when you actually get down to doing guidance and, and how you're going to create a regulatory framework, we really think you need to start with setting high level objectives. Um, very much like the UK, I, I love the term you guys use, which is proportionality. I think it's a far better word than we have, which is graded approach. Uh, the problem with a graded approach, and we found this out with advanced reactor technologies, is they always assume that we're going to be grading downwards uh, in terms of conservatism. The reality is that you could in fact grade upwards. Uh, so regardless, we'll apply proportionality or the Canadian uh, version of that, which is a graded approach. The other thinking we have right now is that you really have to build guidance or requirements for fusion from very simple principles to the complex and not complex to simple. So it's really, in our mind, has to be a bottom-up approach. And, and finally, uh, you heard Sally talk about, uh, you know, the work uh, that the IAE possibly is doing. We're participants along with, with Sally and others in the UK on an IAEA uh, working group that's looking at the potential of maybe harmonizing some aspects or all aspects of regulate, regulating fusion facilities and technology down the road. So I think what I would say is I don't think, and again, based on that Connectrix study, uh, regulating fusion technology, regulating fusion facilities, particularly commercial facilities, is in some ways um, very much in its infancy, but in other ways, it's also going to learn, I think, a lot uh, from what we have already found out uh, regulating uh, fusion facilities for you know, over 70 years now. And it's making sure that you don't have that fission mentality, but understanding the risks with fusion. Um, so with that, I'm going to end my comments and back over to you. Thank you so much, Kevin. That was, that was brilliant. Um, I'd now like to open up uh, anyone to any questions they might have for our panelists. So please do post something in the chat or raise your hands um, with the Zoom, Zoom button. But I'd also like to ask our panelists if they wanna comment on anything one of the other panelists have made or any think that they'd like to add further to what they've they've already said as well. We had a question in the chat. Um, so one is uh, Parag listed agile and forward looking as two of the five identified principles for successful uh, fusion regulation. This is highly encouraging, especially because tech development is a bottleneck for fusion. If we want to iterate the designs for our reactors much more quickly, what are some concrete ways that regulation can keep up? Hi, Anika, do you want me to? Yeah, yeah, sure, if you want to go, but also if any of the other panelists want to jump in as well, yeah. Uh, so I think one, one of the things we, um, so just following on from what Kevin was talking about, so goal, goal setting versus prescriptive. Uh, I think um, we do have um, a goal setting approach in the UK. Uh, and so, and we, and there was some debate about that. We did actually, I mean, there are pros and cons to that. I think one thing though, it's quite a lot of stakeholders did feel that it's, it's, it, it retains flexibility to accommodate new technology concepts. And I think that has been an important factor. Uh, in our consideration. So that's been quite important. We did hear some downsides to that. So one thing is, um, especially internationally, so in, um, to, to you know, private companies from around the world who are used to prescriptive approaches are used to having a checklist uh, which they know if they 
check all the boxes, then they will be granted approval. And so they do have that experience. So coming into the UK can be more difficult for them if they don't have the right guidance and support. Uh, but then balanced against that is, well, if, if it's a new concept and it hasn't been through a prescriptive process before and it hasn't, hasn't been approved before, um, it potentially can be accommodated more uh, flexibly in the UK if we, if we use a, this principles-based approach that, that we have here. So I think we've heard different viewpoints, but I think our focus in the RHC is really about frameworks for what we call disruptive new technology. Uh, and so that feels uh, like there's a lot, lot to, there's a lot to, you know, um, to, to favor like a goal setting approach. Brilliant, thank you. Do any of the other panelists have anything they want to add to that? I can add a little bit to that. I think part of it is what we're kind of terming early engagement with regulatory bodies. So it's not a case of an organisation going away, designing and building a fusion plant and saying, can I turn it on? Um, it's making sure that, you know, we all recognise this is a, a new technology for majority, well, majority of regulators, majority of all of us. So it's making sure that organisations both uh, responsive and support the regulators when they're kind of looking for uh, familiarization and things and also making sure that that organizations um relate to regulators right from the beginning of the design stage because there are many unknowns um i don't think any company is planning to build a first fusion power station and turn it on there will be demonstration reactors those will test out the materials and there'll be lots of things learned uh, on those and, and it's driving other facilities to be created to test those so i think it's it's both um organizations and companies that are developing fusion to you know to to work with regulators and and help provide information and regulators to be open to early information where the where organizations are looking for advice rather than black and white yes or no so i think that's uh, going to be an important part for anybody absolutely can i say something anika yes please join yeah um it, it's just that I, I think it's really important for those who are developing fusion systems to include regulation in the list of criteria that they're going to uh, apply to their design decisions that we can't just plow forward <laughs> to 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 uh, build a working fusion reactor and then think oh we'll solve the waste problem we'll we'll solve the regulation problem we'll solve, we'll solve the safeguards problems at uh, those times this will have to be done at the same time as solving the practical uh, problems with the construction of, uh, of the reactor and making it feasible. I can jump in on that for a second. Um, one of the things I think, Sally, is sort of what you're talking about, and it's very vogue right now in regulatory circles, is the concept of a regulatory sandbox. Um, and that's some, and I, I actually hate that term, but that's what people use. Um, and um, it's, it's a concept whereby, in essence, you, you engage in, I'll call it non-licensing, non-regulatory conversations. You do it early. Um, you maybe allow some experimentation on both sides so that the regulatory body can sort of see the technology, understand the technology a little better. And you don't, let's say, embed what the potential licensee or the proponent will be doing down the road in your licensing basis or your regulatory framework until such time as you actually understand the lessons that have been learned within that, I'll call it regulatory sandbox. So it's a safe, a safe spot for both the regulator and the regulator to understand the technology, to, to grow the technology together. So that I think is something that down the road will be very valuable. And I know the UK is very big on this approach as is uh, uh, the Canadian government in terms of writ large regulating uh, in Canada. Absolutely, thanks Kevin. And I think just to add uh, to everyone's kind of reaffirmed the need to kind of act early on on, on developing a regulatory framework. So we've had a message from uh, the fusion team at Bayes in the chat so they're very keen to hear people's views on uh, the proposed framework so if you'd like to get in touch with them please do and the email address is in the chat it's fusionregulation at bays.gov.uk um we've had a lot of interesting comments and stuff uh, in the chat so please do uh, read through these um i had another question maybe it's a very naive one so everyone's kind of mentioned 
the need for international kind of collaboration and best practice on, on fusion um, regulations. Obviously, we've also discussed how much fission regulations really vary widely from, from country to country in terms of their approaches. I want to ask all of our panelists from their perspectives, do you think it's possible to develop a kind of more global framework for the fusion industry and, and do something completely different from, from what fission has done? Shall I start on that one? Um, yes, it's, it's certainly not an easy task. I mean, you, you could start from your highest level of, right, let's, let's have international law. Um, that's very difficult to achieve. You, you get things in things like the aviation industry where things are generally global. Um, I think I think majority of countries doing fusion will be probably using the nuclear process, sort of assessment process as the basis for what they do. That, that That's probably fair to say, things like safety cases and whatnot and, and, and looking at design. Um, but what we are doing is involving a number of, of nations to try and, I think it was, as somebody said a moment ago, to get some high level principles. Um, we've already talked about the difference between a goal setting regulation which allows an organization to kind of justify what they're doing versus a prescriptive which is the regulator says you shall do this yes or no so even at the very highest level there's some kind of perhaps harmonization between those approaches and with fusion both being many different types of technology and also being new I, I personally believe that a goal setting approach is, is more flexible. So even getting some agreements like that, when you have regulatory bodies that will regulate, unlike the UK, that will regulate both um, fission and fusion, although obviously our environment agency does. So I think the first thing is to get people talking together. I mean, we're talking about a number of years to do this um, and that getting people just to talk to to people about things and then starting that what are the basic principles perhaps the basic principles of radiological safety I see a couple of people in the chat have, have used the phrase hs health safety and environment so it's kind of attacking it from two angles with the hope that we get something in the middle in a few years that allows people to utilize their own frameworks but use some high level principles that would be common so uh, I, I know somebody said why do we need regulation now we're not going to have power plant for 20 years well we need it now because to make it work and learn those lessons uh, and there will be um, discussions about learning lessons from the way fission developed its regulation over the years just get, we're talking we've been talking for a couple of years it's great um, it won't be easy but at least we've got a good basis to start from now I'll jump on that for a minute, maybe or elaborate or not elaborate, but just speak a little more on it. Um, when you when you sort of kind of look at it uh, in terms of, you know, let's say international harmonization, I think what you want to do first is you want to establish internationally what does safe look like? And once and I think that's the value that we'll bring right now in terms of working, let's say, through the IEA or, or whatever, is some high level goals, as Sally said, in terms of what exactly does it mean for a fusion facility to be safe? And once you establish that, then the rest will kind of fall out. Um, but it's, it's really getting to understanding what are the risks, what are the hazards? And what does safe look like? Um, it sounds very simple. It's actually, I think, probably fairly complicated. <laughs> Ewan, did you want to jump in there? Yes, um, I'd just like to say that tritium is a special case. And it, it, uh, it's a special case in the sense that we need to uh, have rather urgently some uh, international consensus as to what are sensible levels uh, for, uh, for limiting emissions uh, on, uh, of tritium. Um, it's difficult uh, because tritium uh, uh, is so active because it, it has a relatively short half-life of about 12.3 years. Um, so the activity levels are, are very high for, for a, a, a particular amount of tritium. Um, but but it's, it's a wimp of a, a, a nucleide in, in the sense that it's a rather weak beta emitter. There's, there's no big evidence of, uh, of what the effects are of, of, of tritium levels uh, in the body uh, have on, on uh, mortality or, or likelihood of getting cancers or, or, or things like that. And there's been a tendency, there's been um, 
uh, pressure groups who are trying to drive the um, the levels of tritium in, in, in emitted into the environment as, as low as possible. And I, I think uh, I, I, I I don't know whether whether there's uh, any comment from the Canadian side uh, for, from uh, on on uh, what, what the situation in Canada, where where now the levels in Ontario are, are so low that I think it it's getting quite difficult to meet uh, meet the requirements from the Canada reactors. It'll be a lot lot worse with with fusion reactors if if the the levels go down too much. Uh, um, I, for, from a Canadian point of view, uh, the one thing I will say is we do have a wealth of experience, given the can do reactors with tritium itself, risk characterization around tritium. Um, I, I, I won't speculate on what a future technology may or may not do in terms of releasing tritium into the environment. So th that remains to be seen, I think, um, in terms of how much of a hazard fusion facilities will pose uh, in, in terms of tritium. Into, in the environment. So it's kind of a non-answer, I guess, which is sometimes what a regulator has to do. Um, I've got another question in the chat. I think we've got time for a couple more, so I'll, I'll rush through them. So one is, uh, do you think fusion facilities should be licensed as nuclear sites? And if not, why? I don't know who wants to take this or if anyone Sally. I can go again if you wish. <laughs> um, so one of, one of the pieces of work that we have been supporting uh, the UK government on, and we've produced a, a technology report, UK a technology report, is, is looking at, at what the actual hazards are, um, largely from tritium, as we just mentioned, but also um, activated dust that may potentially be discharged in excellent scenario. This is based on a lot of international studies that have been carried out over the past 10 or 20 years on potential accidents in actually concept fusion power plant. Uh, so ones of a, a large size rather than the experimental facilities we have. And I think there are, there are two aspects to the question. Um, one is that level of hazard is, is much lower. Um, there, there's a difference obviously between perhaps perception and the science no, nobody likes radioactivity wherever it comes from so that's one of the aspects to be addressed but with regards to whether it should have a nuclear site license there so there are two aspects in, in my, my mind personally one is the framework we use for safety which is uh, about doing detailed accident studies um, looking at how things might be discharged to the atmosphere and having a very rigorous process of doing safety assessment right from your concept design through your commissioning to your build and operate. So one is that what I would call the inner core of assessing safety. That's something at UKA, we very much use those those processes to do safety cases. Then you get the outer layers of regulation, which is um, how much how much deep dive do you do you review safety cases how much auditing do you do do you have license conditions and in my view it's perhaps those aspects that um, don't give you as perhaps as much value when you have lower hazards than when you do have the potentially more significant hazards in nuclear so I, I think and a lot of countries are talking about a hybrid and I, I don't mean hybrid fission fusion reactor I mean a hybrid regulation that takes the, I always say you've got nuclear here, you've got radiological here, you've got fission in the middle. Um, and as Kevin said, let's start working upwards and see what additional we need, um, because what we don't want to do, and um, ITER is always taking an example, ITER in France does have a French nuclear license, that has pushed some engineering, very expensive engineering, that perhaps does not meet that principle of, of balancing um, risk and, and cost on it. So although it's goals, goal, goal related regulation, there is a potential that we might get pushed down something that, that is restrictive. Um, I, I think any framework would actually work um, because it will have the same core, but do we want to have something new to launch a new technology, I think is, is the key to it. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Ali. Does anyone want to add anything to that before we finish? Uh, th there was a question uh, uh, relating to the size of the reactor. 
uh, I'll, I'll just say something about that. Um, the, the, the amount of tritium that's going to be lying around is, is really related to the, uh, uh, the, the, the thermal uh, size of the, uh, the generation of power in the reactor, um, the, i.e. The, the number of fusion events. Um, uh, if, if you go to a smaller reactor in terms of the power and you, you make it more efficient, so the Q engineering value is very high, then, then, then of course, the, the, you'll, you'll reduce the amount of waste and the amount of trit tritium is produced. But if, if we're looking at the reduction in size, which comes from using uh, high temperature superconducting magnets, the, 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 the problem is the wall loadings are much higher on the small compact reactors. And that means you have to change the components more often. And uh, so I, I think that what you you win on making it smaller, you lose on having to uh, uh, replace components more more frequently. Um, but certainly, if you reduce the size size of the reactor, certainly the 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 the, um, uh, the low level waste quantities will go down, even if you don't win completely on the the intermediate level waste. Brilliant. Thanks, June. Um, do any of our Speakers have any final comments they want to add before we before we finish? No? Okay, then I'd like to thank all of our speakers again. This has been a really, really uh, fantastic conversation. I've definitely learned a lot. So I hope everyone else has learned as much as um, as much as I have. Uh, and yeah, just thank you to our speakers once again. And hopefully this encourages more conversations going forward on this very important topic. Thank you very much, Anika. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Rome. Yep. Thank you. Thank Greetings you. again from Canada. Take care. Bye bye bye. Thank you.